going in, on in my head in the past year where I've, I've been, uh, I've started my postdoc in the centre. I originally worked on the um, population genetics of reef fish and now I'm very much focused on answering the question of whether reefs can adapt to um, climate change. Now corals uh, live in an obligate symbiosis with uh, dinoflagellate algae of the genus Symbidinium, also called Zooxanthellae. Now they uh, occupy the inner tissue layers of the coral where they can reach very high densities and uh, they gain um, shelter from their host and uh, the requirements for photosynthesis. Now in return, they provide the coral with a large proportion of their uh, nutritional requirements. And in fact, uh, this symbiosis is seen as one of the major um, ecological and evolutionary um, reasons for the success of coral reefs because it allows them to grow and be competitive uh, while living in very uh, nutrient poor waters. Now coral bleaching uh, refers to the breakdown of this symbiosis. So during stress, the zooxanthellae or the zooxanthellae uh, pigments are expelled from the uh, coral host and the uh, coral goes characteristically white as we've seen in a number of pictures today. Now this uh, decreases the amount of photosynthesis that goes on in the coral, um, obviously, and this can decrease the performance of the coral, leading to increased susceptibility to disease, um, starvation, and ultimately death if the stress is um, bad enough or persistent enough. Now, corals live very close to their upper thermal tolerance limits, and they bleach when this is exceeded. So, this graph here is very similar to the one that Ove showed us in the previous session. It shows the temperature profile at Magnetic Island, uh, just off the coast of Townsville, for about um, 10 years. And what you can see is that temperature fluctuates uh, with the seasons. Now, if the temperature gets uh, high enough, uh, just uh, short of 32 degrees, then corals will bleach. Now, the temperature can get very close to this, um, to, to this uh, threshold here, and, but, but they won't bleach. So it appears that corals live very close uh, to their upper thermal, thermal tolerance. Now, why should we care about that? We should be very concerned about this because with the current temperature projections, um, these maximum temperatures or these bleaching temperatures are likely to be um, reached much more frequently um, in the future. And so it's very likely that bleaching is going to be the order of the day. Now, when we look at coral bleaching, it's not uh, something that is equal across the board. Now, bleaching tolerance is uh, quite variable, both within colonies, as you can see in this picture, where this massive coral is bleached on the top, where, but the sides still uh, appear uh, healthy and uh, still contains a zooxanthellae. Bleaching can vary among colonies or individuals within the same species, as you can see in this picture from the Keppel Islands, where we have uh, three colonies of Acropora millipora, and the colony in the background has almost totally bleached, whereas the two colonies in the foreground, only growing about uh, 30 centimetres away from the bleach one, appear uh, healthy and happy. Now lastly, uh, bleaching uh, tolerance varies greatly among taxa, so that uh, a, a, and, ble uh, and branching corals such as this one in the foreground appear more susceptible. This colony here is totally bleached, whereas the massive coral, uh, colony in the background um, it appears fairly healthy. So this variation that we see in natural systems give us hope, because the substrate for change is variation. So, in order to understand where the coral symbioses can adapt to increasing temperatures, we need to understand what it is about certain symbioses, uh, what makes certain symbioses more tolerant uh, than others. Now, I said to you a moment ago that we need variation for change. Not only do we require variation for uh, change, for evolutionary change, we also need this variation to be heritable that is that if you have a more thermotolerant coral parent, it also needs to produce more thermotolerant coral babies. And in order to study uh, whether, whether these, this variation is heritable, we study the, genetic, the heritable genetic material or the DNA of both corals and zooxanthellae. And we use this information to then uh, better understand what it is that makes certain symbioses uh, more tolerant than others. So what I'd like to talk to you about in the first part of my talk is some of the um, 
processes that can make, uh, that can make, or, uh, make or break uh, the bleaching of a coral. And then in the second part of the talk, I'd like to move on to some genomic approaches that we are getting, uh, that we're using to answer the question uh, about whether coral symbioses can um, adapt. Now, coral uh, zooxanthellae are very simple um, organisms morphologically, basically just little round blobs, about 15 micrometers um, in diameter. However, they are very uh, diverse uh, genetically. Here's a, a schematic representation of the evolutionary relationships among the seven groups or clades of symbi symbidinium that we currently recognise. And of these clades, we find um, three of them on the Great Barrier Reef. Of these three, clade uh, C appears to be the most common type uh, on the Great Barrier Reef. So C in this figure is indicated by the green colour. And you can see that most corals are dominated by clade C, zooxanthellae, although some of them contain clade D, and a few of them have uh, clade A. Now, it's recently become evident from research undertaken by, uh, within the Centre of Excellence that um, not only do corals appear to be dominated by one uh, zooxanthellae type, but they are, in fact, able to contain small amounts of other strains or clades in their tissues. So that's what I've indicated by this uh, cartoon up here. We have a coral uh, that is dominated by clade C, zooxanthellae, but they have a couple of clade D uh, zoics in their tissues as well. Now, why should we care about this? Why does it matter what kind of zooxanthellae type a coral will um, uh, host? Well, this is very important because the performance of zooxanthellae differ. Now, clade D zooxanthellae are generally recognised to be uh, to perform better at higher temperatures. So in this graph here, you can see that the photosynthesis of uh, clade C, uh, clade D zooxanthellae is much higher than clade C zooxanthellae at higher temperatures. And in fact, the variation in thermotolerance that I've shown you in this picture can be explained by the uh, type of zooxanthellae that the corals uh, host. So this bleached coral in the background had uh, clade C zooxanthellae and the two colonies in the foreground that appear to be okay after this temperature spike uh, host clade D uh, zooxanthellae. However, as with most things in life, nothing is for free and uh, this increased thermotolerance uh, comes at a, at a cost. So generally, uh, growth rate is related to the zooxanthellae type. The growth rate of the coral is related to the zooxanthellae type that it hosts, and uh, generally higher in clade C uh, cor corals containing clade C zooxanthellae to corals that contain clade D. And I'll return to this point uh, a little later in the talk. So if Corals uh, host different types of zooxanthellae, and different zooxanthellae types have different thermotolerances. Can corals change the symbionts that they associate with and in this way increase their, um, the temperatures that they can cope with? Now, exactly this question was the um, topic of an investigation undertaken by uh, researchers at the Centre of Excellence, Ames, and their collaborators. In this study, they worked on Acropora millipora from three locations on the Great Barrier Reef, um, Davis Reef and Keppel Island in the southern GBR contain uh, mainly uh, contain C, C2, which is a, a subclade of the C, so C uh, symbionts, and at uh, Magnetic Island, they contain D symbionts. Now, what these researchers did was that, that they took these uh, corals from these two locations and they transplanted them into the Townsville population. And they did this in autumn and then they sort of sat back and uh, did other things and waited for summer to pass. Now the summer that uh, preceded this transplant wasn't a particularly hot summer and the corals at Magnetic Island were in fact fine during this. They did not bleach and so consequently before the experiment, they, before the experiment started, they contain clade D zooxanthellae and, and they contain to host this uh, uh, zooxanthellae type. Now corals from both Davis Reef and Keppel Island bleached during the summer. Now I said it wasn't a particularly hot summer, but they did experience temperatures that were higher than those they were used to from their native locations. Now where uh, the Davis Reef corals are uh, 
the Davis Reef corals that recovered, recovered with the same zooxanthellae type. Whereas the, the Keppel, Keppel Island um, corals had uh, recovered with a different zooxanthellae type, the clay D, the more thermotolerant type that's uh, commonly found at Magnetic Island. And then when uh, the thermotolerance of these cor uh, corals was examined, it was found that the Davis Reef corals that had retained the same zooxanthellae type had no change in their thermotolerance. But the Magnetic Island, uh, uh, the, sorry, the Keppel Island corals that had changed their symbiont type to the more tolerant one uh, in, uh, actually enjoyed an increased thermotolerance by a degree to a degree and a half. So this study clearly shows that bleaching can alter the dominant symbiont and that it can increase the thermotolerance of, of the corals. However, as I said before, um, this uh, increase in thermotolerance is not free. It does come at a cost, uh, uh, potentially uh, in the form of a reduced growth rate. And uh, this reduced growth rate uh, can potentially lead to a, uh, a change in the uh, competitive interactions between uh, corals. We don't know much about that at this, at this point in time. So it's, it's probably unlikely to be a major evolutionary mechanism for corals to adapt to uh, higher temperatures. And in fact, uh, corals tend to revert back to their original symbiont type after the stress has passed, indicating that this is not, in fact, a heritable um, response. So I'd now like to uh, move on and talk about uh, some research undertaken in our group uh, where we are, uh, again, aimed at um, answering the question about whether coral symbioses can adapt to uh, increasing temperatures. However, in this... Uh, in this um, uh, this, this approach is, is a more genomic approach. We're looking at um, the DNA of the coral and the, uh, and the symbionts uh, with uh, the aim of uh, uh, looking at uh, identifying the genes and the genetic pathways uh, involved in uh, uh, the sort of stresses that we might associate with climate change, such as bleaching, uh, increase in CO2, perhaps increased uh, levels of, of disease. Now, we uh, not only look at the, the genomes of these or organisms, we also look at how these genomes work. Uh, and this uh, we call gene expression. And we, we want to ultimately then link that back into explaining the variation in phenotypes or variation in bleaching susceptibility that we can observe. Now, I think it might be useful uh, to just take a step back and explain to you what I mean by genomics and what I mean by gene expression, because these are fairly uh, specialised terminologies. Now, when I talk about genomics, I basically talk about... A, that refers to uh, a lot of the ge uh, genetic material. So when we do the genomics of coral or the genomics of, uh, of zooxanthellae, we look at a great uh, part of, a large part of the uh, genetic material of these organisms. Now, you may be familiar with the fact that all cells in your body have the same amount of DNA or the same DNA, but clearly not all cells are the same. Uh, it's, it, no one will argue that this, a cell in your eye is not working very differently to a cell in your finger, for example. And, and what makes these cells different is the way that this DNA is expressed or the way that this DNA is behave, it behaves. So gene expression uh, describes the way that the DNA or the genes is read and to what degree. So we, can, we talk about upregulation or downregulation of genes. It means that more or less of that gene is, is read in that cell and consequently turned into our proteins. Now, a very significant sequencing effort of the uh, genomes of both uh, coral and zooxanthellae have been undertaken by researchers in the Centre of Excellence and their collaborators, of course. Uh, what has come out of this is that our corals uh, have surprisingly large genomes. Now, when you consider the evolutionary position of corals in between here, between yeast and uh, the model invertebrates and humans, you might predict that corals should contain about 8,000 genes or so. Now, as it turns out, they have, in fact, uh, about 20,000 genes, and uh, this is similar to uh, the number of genes found in humans. 
Now, this uh, posed a bit of an evolutionary enigma, why this is so, and it actually uh, really throws a lot of the assumptions about vertebrate or um, metazone, metazone evolution um, up in the air. Uh, about 10,000 of these genes have now been sequenced and provide a wonderful uh, resource uh, for us to, uh, to, re to, to start looking at what goes on in, in corals in more detail. Now, one thing that has come out of this is that not only do corals have very large genomes, they also have very complex genomes. So about half of the genes examined... Oops, sorry. About half of the genes examined... Uh, in the corals were in fact highly similar to what we might find in humans and 12% of these genes were, have only been identified in humans and not in the model invertebrates. So again this uh, threw a, a couple of people off, the, uh, off their perch. What, what, are, what are corals doing with these genes that are um, normally associated with vertebrates? In addition to these uh, vertebrate genes, we uh, have also, or, or people in the centre have also identified many other genes in corals that have only been known uh, in plants and bacteria so far. And, and it's really interesting um, how, um, how these uh, presumably uh, or quite simple animals actually have both large and complex genomes. Uh, many genes are also very specialised, so um, corals have very um, complex nervous system genes, for example, the photoreceptor uh, L-transretinal dehydrogenase. Uh, this is involved in vision in humans, but uh, corals don't have, uh, have very simple nervous systems, so what are they doing with these complex genes? We're currently undertaking research to answer this question. A lot of uh, research focus uh, is also being put into the uh, immunity defence of corals and we're uh, finding that uh, corals have many of the key uh, vertebrate and invertebrate immunity genes and pathways such as the canonical toll-like toll receptor pathways. And, uh, and again, current research is, is going into, a lot of research is going into understanding how these genes and pathways work do they work in similar ways to human and other invertebrates? And, and this information is going to help us understand how corals will deal with uh, diseases and increased race, rates of diseases potentially associated with increased temperatures. Now, parallel to the sequencing effort in uh, corals, uh, has uh, a, a major sequencing effort of the Symbidinium genome has also been undertaken. And currently about 5,000 genes have been sequenced. Uh, an examination of these genes have really uh, firmed up, oh, sorry about that, have really firmed up the position of uh, Symbiodinium in this uh, alveolate uh, group. Uh, in this group we find a range of parasitic organisms uh, such as the malaria parasite in the epicomplexa. And again, uh, as with the corals, uh, this um, this sequencing uh, resource is now um, providing the foundation from, for a range of studies that are really going to get at the root of the question of whether corals and their uh, coral symbioses can adapt to climate change. So a number of these uh, studies include uh, carbon acquisition under increased CO2 level, the role of heat stress both within and among clades, uh, the, the a role of eutrophication and symbiosis. Now I'd like to, in the last part of my talk, just to move on to uh, describing how we can also use this sequence information to look at how genes behave. And we do this using microarrays. Microarrays are a very nice tool that allows us to look at the behaviour of thousands of genes in one hit. And this allows us to identify which genes are important in particular processes, such as bleaching, disease, and so forth. And not only can we identify the important genes, but we can also look at how they vary, both, within, um, both among individuals, among populations, and so forth. And again, this is the sort of information that we need to, to answer the question of whether coral symbioses can adapt uh, to climate change. So here's uh, a study that I have just uh, undertaken. That, uh, th this study looked at uh, variation in gene expression. In fact, uh, gene expression has been suggested to be uh, a highly adaptive uh, response. 
and uh, potentially very important for selection because it is very quick. However, we know very little about gene expression in corals. Now, what I did in this study was I went to two locations, Davis Reef and Orpheus Island. So Davis Reef is out here, and Orpheus Island it is, is in here. And these are very different environments. They differ in their temperature um, profiles, uh, in their light environment, uh, in the amount of nutrients in the water and sediments and so forth. So very different places for corals to uh, live. We find a significant genetic structure between these two locations, uh, so they really do appear to be, uh, to f be functioning, uh, to have the potential to function in different ways. However, they contain the same uh, zooxanthellae type. I then um, took them back into the um, aquarium. I put them in a common environment for 10 days, and then I looked at patterns of gene expression in the wild and in the aquarium. And what I was interested in was to look at whether gene expression was, in fact, uh, able to change, whether there were differences among populations, and whether populations responded to the change in environment in different ways. Now, I've um, summarised my results here in the form of a heat map. What a heat map describes is the behaviour of uh, genes in rows and samples individuals in columns. And what you can see is that gene expression changed over time in 85 of the uh, 9,000 genes that I looked at. There was a significant difference between day one and day 10, day one over here, quite counterintuitively, and day 10 here. Basically, there were two responses. There were the response where genes were uh, expressed to a high level, indicated by the dark colour in the wild, and this um, was down-regulated in the lab, and vice versa, a low expression in the, in the wild and much higher expression in the lab. So this uh, shows that gene expression is flexible and that it can change rapidly. These changes occurred um, between day one and day 10. Now there was very little difference between the two locations. However, there was only five genes out of the 9,000 genes that are surveyed that were different uh, in their expression at day one in the wild. And only one gene was uh, differentially expressed at day 10. Now, that um, was quite surprised. Oh, sorry, and here I've indicated the expression of one of those five genes. So this is very typical for all of them. There was a high expression in this gene at Orpheus Island uh, compared to Davis, um, Davis Reef. And then in both uh, locations, this expression was uh, downregulated in the lab. Now, this result was a, a bit of a surprise given the, um, the difference in the environments uh, that we see out there. Now, it's also noteworthy that both locations responded, corals from both locations responded in the same way when they were brought into the lab. So there was a, 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 a commonality in the way that they reacted to the change in environment. Now, I'm now going to uh, actually look into whether the differences um, in, envir in, in the environments, perhaps a gene expression arising from those uh, differences may only uh, be expressed during uh, times of stress. So we have a whole lot of experiments planned that will look at the gene expression of corals from different locations and with different zooxanthellae types uh, during um, non-stressed and stressed conditions. So to get back to the question that I posed in the introduction, can corals adapt to climate change? What is the current state of knowledge? Now we know that there's variation in the bleaching susceptibility among individuals and populations and that a change in the symbiont can in increase the bleaching threshold by a couple of degrees. But given the uh, current projections in temperature increases, this is unlikely to, to be enough in the long term. In addition, this doesn't appear to be a heritable um, trait, and it does uh, probably come with an ecological um, cost to pay. Now, we know that um, both corals and zooxanthellae have very complex genes and uh, complex patterns of gene expression. Gene expression can change rapidly, and this certainly suggests that there is some potential for adaptation, but at, at this current uh, moment, we, um, we can't definitively um, uh, put that down. Now, I hope you haven't been sitting on the edge of your seats waiting for me to say, 
yes or no to the question of whether corals can adapt to climate change. Um, I guess it's probably unlikely given that it's after lunch and the fact that the seats are incredibly comfortable. What, um, uh, we are not able to answer this question at this point in time, but what we do have are um, some amazing genomic resources to, to go out and address this question in wild systems. And so I think that when we uh, meet again next, I, I believe that we will have some very concrete answers to this uh, very big and important question. Thank you. Time for a few questions.